Okay, let's start with a quick review of the uh, second law. And, ooh, that interesting. Uh, so, second law of thermo. And just qualitatively, uh, we remember that it, it includes a couple things. One, heat won't flow spontaneously from cold to hot. Flow from cold to hot. We have to do work to get the heat energy to move from cold to hot. It won't happen spontaneously. Um, second thing, uh, closed systems always move towards higher disorder. Okay. Uh, again, that's that idea of entropy. Move towards higher disorder. So if they're free of outside influences, if there's no work being done on them, uh, then the entropy increases. Higher disorder. And uh, kind of what we're going to talk about in this section is that heat engines cannot change all of the uh, thermal energy into work. So they can't be 100% efficient. Can't turn all heat into work. That would imply perpetual motion or perpetual energy or, or a, a ideal system that just doesn't, in fact, exist. Okay, so let's talk about heat engines a little bit more. It's really just any device that converts heat into mechanical work. So we're taking thermal energy, converting it into work, we call it a heat engine. Now, generally, heat's taken into the engine from something that we call a hot reservoir. And it's just a term for the higher temperature components, where the heat is coming from that heat in some fashion is then converted into useful mechanical work in the system and then whatever heat is left over that hasn't been converted into work gets sent from the system into what's called a cold reservoir and we use that term cold reservoir but uh, don't get hung up on it because all it means is that the temperature of the cold reservoir is less than the temperature of the hot reservoir. So it could still be very hot, relatively speaking. Now, in an ideal heat engine, again, there would be 100% efficiency, but as we just mentioned, that's impossible. So the actual efficiency, which we're going to symbolize with this little N-looking thing down here, is simply the workout, which is the W, divided by the energy in the heat engine, or the, the temperature, the, heat, the, the thermal energy in the heat engine, rather. Now, uh, another way to express this, and what's actually an expression for the best efficiency possible, for any particular uh, heat engine, it's the difference in energy between the hot uh, reservoir and the cold reservoir divided by the hot reservoir. And this gives us our best efficiency, the highest efficiency that you could actually have in any given uh, heat reservoir. And if we were to look at the actual math in this, uh, we know that Q is MC delta T, uh, and this actually works out where we can simply do the temperature of the hot minus the temperature of the cold divided by the temperature of the hot, all in Kelvin, and that's again going to give us the same numerical value. So we can use the Kelvin temperature as well. Now, if we try and just model this idea of a heat engine as simply as possible, we start with our 
heat engine up here. We have some amount of thermal energy because it's a higher temperature. That energy flows down through the actual engine itself. And it depends on the actual type of engine, but in some way, shape, or form, the energy travels from the hot reservoir into the engine, at which point it gets used to generate work. And so you get some amount of work out. Any leftover energy, any leftover heat, continues through the engine and gets spit out into the cold reservoir as waste heat. And so the work that actually gets done is the energy in, this right here, minus the energy out, this down here. Whatever's left over, whatever the difference is, that's how much energy actually got converted into work. And again here, we're assuming that no energy gets lost to the outside environment, which as we know is not practical or not real, but at this point we're just looking at an ideal situation. Now, a couple hundred years ago, uh, this guy named Sadie Carnot realized that uh, the problem was that we had irreversible processes in the conversion of mechanical work to heat. And so that if we're going to avoid these irre yeah, irreversible processes, we could actually increase the efficiency of a heat engine. And he stated that the maximum efficiency of any heat engine is going to occur if and only if no new entropy is created in the cycle. And what that means is that the energy in the hot reservoir and the energy in the cold reservoir remain constant. And he developed, or he kind of theorized, what we call now the Carnot cycle. And the Carnot cycle is just kind of a model of an ideal heat engine functioning. And if we look at this in, in four steps, uh, the first step in the Carnot cycle is what we call isothermal expansion. And if, you, if you've ever heard that prefix iso, it simply means the same or something staying the same. And so in isothermal expansion, the temperature is constant. It doesn't change. Okay. What we're looking at here is a pressure, which is up there, versus volume graph. And we have two temperatures. We have a hot temperature and we have a cold temperature. We'll get to the cold temperature in a minute. But in the first step of this, in the isothermal expansion phase of the Carnot cycle, you have a, a gas that's expanding. And so if this, imagine, you know, we can use a, a car engine as an example. And this is a piston in a car engine, and you have some gas in this, this piston, you're adding energy to the system. And as you're adding energy to the system, you have some amount, and this energy is coming from the hot reservoir. Okay, So you have energy transferred in the system from the hot reservoir. The gas in here absorbs that thermal energy, and it expands. And as it expands, it does work on its surroundings. It does work on its surroundings and pushes the piston up. And as it expands and it does work on the piston, that energy gets transferred or gets changed into work. And so remembering the temperature is the average kinetic energy of the molecules, because we're doing work on the piston, the temperature remains constant. So the energy being added into the system gets converted into work. The temperature remains constant. The pressure, if we look at this line, the pressure decreases. 
the volume in this part of the of the scenario is increasing. Okay, then this is what we call adiabatic expansion. And this may be a new term. Uh, adiabatic, this term right here, simply means that the work done on the system do occurs without any energy lost to the outside. So there's no energy, no heat lost to the outside environment. Okay, so any change in the internal energy of the gas is going to be completely due to work being done on the system. So there's no energy lost in the, envi in the environment. Now, the reality of this is that, again, there are very f there's no real situation where it's a perfectly insulated environment. There's always going to be a little bit that radiates out to the outside that gets through the insulation. The closest thing that we can have to a true adiabatic uh, process is generally when something happens very, very quickly. So the expansion occurs so quickly that there's no time for energy to actually get lost to the environment. And so this is where we generally see those. But what does happen as we go from one volume to the next, so you see here we're increasing the volume still, so we're decreasing the pressure, the temperature actually does drop. And so in this case, the temperature is dropping because the heat is being converted to mechanical work. And so the net energy inside the molecules of the gas is decreasing, but it's all being converted to work. And so our temperature drops to some colder temperature as the chamber, in this case, expands. The third step is what we call isothermal compression. And again, isothermal tells us that the temperature remains constant. In this case, we have compression, though. And the reason that there's compression is because energy is being pulled out, energy is being transferred from the heat engine into the cold reservoir. And as that happens, as this gas loses energy, it's either, it has to either, um, well, it has to compress because we're losing energy. And so we have to, in order to keep the temperature constant, the volume has to decrease. And as the volume decreases, the pressure increases, but the temperature stays the same. And so this line right here is a, an isotherm. It's a line of constant temperature at specific pressures and volumes for that gas. And so our compression occurs, our chamber decreases, and then we have the last of this cycle, and this is what we call adiabatic compression. And just like the adiabatic expansion, in adiabatic compression, all of the work or all of the transfer of energy occurs only between work and thermal energy. There's no energy lost to the environment. And so the piston in this case is going to push down and do work on the gas. And so there's going to be an increase in the energy, the heat, in the gas. And that increase in energy occurs at the same time as our volume decreases. So our volume is decreasing, our pressure is, and our, our volume is decreasing, and our temperature is increasing. And so if we think about our gas laws, if volume decreases and temperature increases, we're going to have a very large increase in pressure and that's what actually happens. So in the fourth step of the Carnot cycle we have isothermal compression and in this 
uh, section, the surroundings, in this case our piston, does work on the gas. And, and again, we're assuming that there's no loss to the surroundings. Uh, and this brings the temperature back up to where we started. So this is a uh, reversible process because you can see we start here, we go through our isothermal compression, adiabatic compression, isothermal expansion, adiabatic, or excuse me, isothermal compression, adiabatic compression, and we get right back to where we started. Okay, so it's reversible because we can get back to the beginning. Okay, um, if we were to get this in terms of a, a temperature graph, we would see that our for the isothermal portions, temperature, and actually we can put uh, entropy down here, okay, so we have isothermal uh, expansion, then we have our step two, which is the adiabatic expansion, adiabatic, and you can see that during the adiabatic expansion, our temperature drops. Then we have our isothermal compression, in which case uh, we're decreasing the entropy back to where it started. Notice that our entropy is still equal to zero. Our delta S is going to end up being equal to zero. It can never be less than zero. And then the last step is our adiabatic compression, which brings us back up to the temperature where we started with uh, an increase in the temperature. Now if we look at our pressure volume Graph all together. Again, A to B is our isothermal expansion. B to C is our adiabatic expansion. C to D is our isothermal compression. And then D to A takes us back. That's our adiabatic compression. Now, in this particular graph, the work that gets done by the engine is actually the area inside this curve, this shape. Now obviously it's not something that's easy to find. Um, this is where you get into calculus. But uh, just understand that the work done is equal to the area inside the curves. Okay, The area that's bounded by this shape. Now, as we mentioned, in this uh, Carnot cycle, the Carnot engine, the total change in entropy along the path is zero. Uh, but along the, along the um, isotherms, we actually have changes in entropy. The total change in entropy is zero, but the change in entropy along each of our paths, because there's a change in uh, the energy and the temperature is equal to the energy whoops, over the temperature. Okay, So the energy in the system divided by the temperature of the hot reservoir. The change in entropy along the second isotherm where we have the um, the the compression, and where we're losing energy, it's actually negative QC over TC. And in a true uh, Carnot cycle, these two values ha should have the same 
magnitude. Same magnitude in an ideal Carnot cycle. Okay. Okay, and this is what we're showing here. So the change in entropy, the total change in entropy, is equal to the two the change in entropy along the isotherm one plus the change in entropy along isotherm two, which as we said, the magnitudes of these two are going should be theoretically equivalent. So that gives us a a total value of zero. If we do a little rearranging here, we can see that the ratio of the energy the energy of the cold reservoir divided by the energy in the hot reservoir is equal to the ratio of the temperature of the cold reservoir divided by the temperature of the hot reservoir. And so this is why uh, previously I had mentioned that when we look at our efficiency equation, while it's actually QH minus QC divided by QH, we can actually also use our temperatures because mathematically they're going to end up being equivalent. And realistically, this is something that you would find more easily, something that you would have more easily. Now, in addition to heat engines, we also have what we call heat pumps. And heat pumps are similar to heat engines, except in a heat pump, we're moving heat generally uh, up the gr or from cold to hot, so not in the way that it naturally goes. And in order to actually get the energy to move, we have to do work on it. And so the heat pump takes heat from a source at a low temperature, moves it to a higher temperature by doing work on the pump. Okay. So if we think about what our basic model for our heat engine looked like, it was the opposite of this. Here, we're taking energy from our cold reservoir. We're moving it through our heat pump. The heat pump is doing work on the system in order to get the energy into the hot reservoir. This is how air conditioners, uh, this is how refrigerators and freezers work. Even though it's already colder inside the refrigerator, inside the freezer than it is outside, the pump in there, the, basically what it's doing is taking more energy out of that colder area and moving it to the hotter area. If you ever feel back behind your refrigerator, you're going to feel that it's a lot warmer because that's where all that energy is getting spit out. It's getting spit out in the back of your, out behind your refrigerator or freezer. And so, uh, very uh, basically, what happens is this is going to be in the uh, colder part, the colder area. So whether it's inside the refrigerator freezer, whether it's inside your house when the air's on, you have coils with some fluid in them. And that fluid absorbs energy, takes in energy from the outside system. And it goes through the heat pump, which is generally a compressor. That compressor compresses the fluid down to a, a higher density. So a lot of times it'll start as a gas here and it'll compress it down and it'll be a liquid here. Now, in that compression process, it actually increases the temperature. And so the temperature gets increased and so it travels out here into the outside environment and because the temperature is higher, in the fluid in the coils, energy flows from the hotter fluid to the outside environment. As it passes through the condenser, that heat gets uh, pushed out in the environment, 
where it comes along here, comes down, and it goes through what's called an expansion valve. And as it goes through this expansion valve, it does exactly what happens. It expands. Uh, it'll turn right back into a gas, and as it turns into a gas, the temperature drops, and the temperature drops so that it's below the temperature in the surroundings. It absorbs energy, moves through the coils, gets compressed again, temperature increases, it pushes the heat out in the environment, comes down through, and, and it goes through the whole cycle again. But the key here is this compressor right here. The compressor does work on the fluid to compress it down so that the temperature increases and so that the energy can flow out into the surrounding environments. Okay, and so this is kind of what we just mentioned. The heat's extracted from the air outside. Uh, even cold air, and this, this is key, even cold air has thermal energy. Okay, even the air in your freezer, in your refrigerator, has thermal energy. You know, you have thermal energy until you get to zero Kelvin, right? Because that, that just means that the molecules are moving, so they have some energy. Uh, the vapor in the exterior coils absorbs the heat. It gets compressed. This is where the work is done, and the temperature increases. Okay, So the compressor does work on the gas, on the fluid. The temperature increases. It circulates um, as a condensed liquid and releases heat. And in this case, we're taking heat from the outside, uh, but it's the just the opposite of an air condition. This is how you get heat in your house, even though it's cold outside. Uh, here we're taking heat from outside, bringing it in. Air conditioners take heat from inside and take it out. So here on the, the hot coils, it gets condensed as a liquid. The heat's released into the house. And as it moves back outside, it passes through that expansion valve where it expands back into a gas and the temperature drops. And cooling, like you said, it's just the exact opposite. Extract, heat's extracted from the lower temperature and ejected into the surroundings. And if you ever go back out to where your, your heat pump is, which is the big metal box that's going to be outside your house somewhere, you'll see that there are small uh, copper pipes generally going into it, and what's inside there are many, many, va there are many, many um, tubes, basically, that that fluid goes through and there's a giant fan in there and when it's running that fan kicks on and that fan is blowing air past those pipes to carry the heat away so that it acts more efficiently and same thing um, when, it's, when it's acting in reverse it's trying to carry more warm air past it and so as that air is flowing, it's more efficient, it gets the hot air away or brings warm air in, and so the whole system works better. And those are how engines, heat engines, and heat pumps work.